your role in the Indian policing system and the international policing system uh, tell you in terms of the shades of gray that are emerging as society moves on? What was said uh, probably a few years ago is much more acceptable today than it was at that time. Uh, audiences and individuals and civil societies are pretty much more uh, aware of certain things that the police was probably saying a lot earlier. Uh, having said that, uh, you're also, I hear, preparing an agenda for uh, uh, some rules, boundary conditions, or thought processes for post-government uh, on uh, artificial intelligence. So there are lots of shades of gray. Would you like to begin your comments on, on those at the first instance? Thank you. Thank you, Roji. Uh, I'll just begin with uh, listing five points which I have framed for this discussion, and that they, these are the need for this surveillance. Is there a really a need for this? Secondly, uh, what are the conditions which justify these need? Under what conditions these this should be evoked? Procedure for that, audit trails, and oversight. Uh, and these are the five dimensions, I think, on which the system should be evolved, and we have to judge the, uh, uh, these shades of gray on these five dimensions. As far as the need is concerned, I'm, I'm uh, pardon me, I'm not going into the uh, commercial aspect of it. I'm looking more into the national security and the security of citizens aspect. Although sometimes it is acceptable in the society that they are more agreeable to the profit motive rather than the security of citizens for surveillance, which is a sad case, I would say. But in terms of need, I would, uh, uh, my esteemed senior is here, he will vouch for me, that the traditional ways of looking at crime involve three approaches. Either we would go to a scene of crime, pick up evidence and uh, reach to the criminal. Second, we would follow the money and reach to the criminal. And third was the intelligence-led approach. These were the three basic models of crime, uh, uh, looking at crime. In the current digital space, what has happened is, when we try to go from the scene of crime, what are we going through? All of us are aware of the issues related to attribution in the cyberspace. We will be reaching up to maximum an IP address, at best. And that too, we are not sure if it is the actual IP address or the proxy one. In terms of the money trail, with the advent of cryptocurrencies, NFTs, etc., that is again getting blocked. So the only way with, uh, through which we can perform our duty to keep the society safe in these kind of spaces would be an uh, intelligence-led approach. Now, coming to that aspect, I would say the need is now intelligence is not equal to surveillance. There are many aspects to that. Surveillance is just one small part. And there, we have to look at, uh, in certain cases, based on certain criteria, the surveillance would be justified. And therefore, the approach to define these gray areas, as you mentioned, would be to define these parameters on which uh, we can justify. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Seth would be elaborating on the parameters which have been already identified under Indian laws as well as the rules. Uh, what are the parameters which can be used for uh, justifying the case? But once they are just identified, then the question is, what is the procedure? What are the audit trails? And is there an oversight mechanism to look at whether there has been a case of misuse or not? Now, the first thing that happens in a state, scene of crime, at least in India, that we are, some of us here are familiar, is the, uh, the takeover of our mobile phone. And then all the data goes in the hands of the uh, person who uh, swoops in. So where does oversight and uh, all this come in in the real practical world? In the real practical world, if you see when a, and Dr. Seth will bear me out, when a property is seized, it is a court property. So it is the court which allows the investigating officer to operate on that. And those, whatever comes out of that will be, uh, will have to be produced before the court. So there is an oversight mechanism of judiciary there. And court can deny and ask for release of those also, order for release of those. So there is an existing oversight mechanism. It is not that it just happens without any oversight. But having said that, I'm not, it is not the case that there are no cases of 
misuse or uh, there are no cases of excess there. But is this a ground for giving up our duty to protect the citizens? We have to be better enforcers, better enforcers of, uh, for ourselves also in terms of how we implement the rules and procedures. And that is the what way about forward. the thing to protect people in power? Sorry? The thing to protect people in power is what probably law enforcement agencies are often accused of. I don't think that is our duty. Our duty is to protect the citizens. I, I can see the smiles, but that is the duty. And if you look at the Constitution, that is our duty. Our wrong interpretation is not a justification for changing the role. <laughs> right. So, so uh, the the framework is uh, pretty much there, and uh, you would you would be you know you vantage point of international as well as India here. So, in a word, what you say is that inter it, does that include interception of calls? Obviously, uh, in the license condition, yes. Sorry, in the license condition, for sure, there is a very elaborate process, but. In practical terms, like you've been a special commissioner, you've gone up the ladder from the ACP level upwards. So is there a uh, respect for that particular uh, there's process? Not a, there's not a single interception without the proper procedure. And there are oversight mechanisms. Are the oversight mechanism working properly? That can be debatable. But the procedures are laid out. And we have to make sure that they work. And. Uh, to answer your previous question also, the, the importance of oversight is reflected even in that uh, question. Who is able to look at what uh, law enforcement does? And that is important and that has been prescribed. And if you look at the detailed procedures which have been laid out, I am not talking only of Indian system, but I am talking internationally. The procedures are there. But that there are also cases of excesses and misuse. But that's for, and that is the reason why these procedures are there, and we have to implement the outcomes of these procedures. Right, and, and there is the big bad corporate, which has uh, you know the servers are located outside, and therefore the ability of uh, states and jurisdictions to to get the data which is relevant for the safety of society as a whole. Uh, is governed by the MLAT process. Would you like to just share the kind of uh, delays that uh, thwart uh, any ability in tangible sense to get information? So M MLAT is basically mutual legal assistance treaties between different jurisdictions and that's where if we have to get a, uh, get a response to our request for data or uh, any investigation lead, maybe we would be reaching out to different intermediaries who may be in possession of a relevant data. And if it is in a different jurisdiction, then the between the central authority of the sending country to the central authority of the recipient country, the, uh, the procedure is done through MLAT. There have been uh, various studies which have been uh, undertaken to identify the time taken for uh, implementation and answering of MLAT requests, which I would say has improved over the last few years, but it is still far from satisfactory, and it is in light of uh, the kind of crime or the digital space which we are dealing with is, uh, I'll say, grossly inappropriate in terms of the time taken. By the time we will receive anything of uh, significance, it will so, so be is used. Is it in uh, hours or days? Or what is the framework? Uh, the, what are these studies saying, presumably? Uh, I, I did a one study a long time back. That was in 2000, I think, 11. And the average time taken at that point of time in terms of MLATs and uh, letter rogatories put together was three years, two months average time. And that is the case in which the, requ the answers had come. So it's as good as uh, nothing. It's better to seize the phone. I would say the, when the phone is available and the judiciary allows it, it is good to seize that. <laughs> OK. So this sets us up nicely for uh, Professor Veronica. Uh,
Varadmukha, uh, how do you see uh, the, what would you tell your students? How, do, would, how would they be able to, uh, you know, negotiate the world that uh, uh, our speaker has just pointed out, the subtleties, the shades of gray, uh, the delays that happen in the due process, and the changes that are already being emphasized. What, do you, what would you tell your students? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question and also to get invited to such an interesting event. Uh, it's an honor to be with you and respect for everyone who is spending the uh, Thursday night with us. Um, but let me make the conversation a little bit more itchy. Uh, I'm an anthropologist. I'm a social scientist and I'm going out and talk to people and live with them and follow them and try to understand their experiences with all kinds of technologies in very marginal positions as women, as adults, as parents, as mothers, as refuge, as ethnic minorities in a foreign context, as people without identities. And it's a very different kind of reality what you can explore. So my message is from the education and from the researcher perspective, how can we explore how individuals and bigger groups and global societies anticipate different kind of forces above the legislation. We can't deny that we need the rule of law in different contexts to help the legislative frameworks to take care of the protection infrastructures and um, many normatively frameable, textually embedded situations the relations between corporates and states. But we also need to understand that above these kind of legislative and, and technocratic and also uh, um, very hardcore uh, hardware and software relationships, there is something which is called culture, some which is called politics, something which is called literacy, and something which is called desire. Because if I check your phone and how you use your phone, will I see a very responsible tech expert who is very data conscious and doesn't allow any kind of seduction in life? And this seduction can be just shopping those pair of shoes, just checking those websites, just clicking through, and what kind of forces because of your language pull you towards Telegram in place of Signal, pulling you towards WhatsApp in place of Viber, taking you off from Facebook and forcing you to be all each other and to catch on each other on LinkedIn. And what, how these kind of social mechanisms, how these forces of cancel culture, conformism, are actually overwriting those kind of normative, rational decisions we are all aware of, and how to engage with those kind of cultural and economic processes that are shaping this kind of decision makings of people in a less or more powerful positions. Right, so uh, obviously uh, there is a layer that uh, we are not here to force a consensus among the speakers. It's quite evidently uh, the experience and the texture difference that we are here to celebrate. So coming to uh, Amaila, uh, what do you think of uh, uh, this business of uh, uh, what is in public interest versus individual privacy? Uh, what do you see happening in Nigeria and as an advisor to the government on certain uh, moving goalposts? Uh, what is it that uh, is uh, relevant to one government in power and as and when there is a change in the individual uh, in control? How do things uh, pan out? Thank you very much for the question. Um, like you've rightly said, a regime change, for instance, can lead to different priorities. If you're looking at the issue of surveillance, for instance, um, what one government may find as relevant or something that they must keep um, record of another government may feel as if it's not as relevant. One government may decide to look at their political enemies, for instance, and focus on them only. Another government may decide to look at economic criminals, you know, and focus on those people. And so these things would impact um, what kind of data is being looked for 
or being gathered, if I may use that word, by the government, what they want to do with that information, how long they're going to keep it for, you know, if they're going to even acquire it the right way or not, you know, because sometimes, desperate times, you know. So, but I, 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 I rather choose to focus on the part of the user, right, we the people that all have smartphones, I can see people bringing up their phones, right, what are we doing, you know, to play into these issues, the issues of surveillance that we are complaining about, even though it's necessary, as someone has rightly pointed out, or the issue of um, identity theft by virtue of you giving out so much information about yourself on the internet, or the issue of um, businesses commercializing your data, you know, using it to sell you certain items by infusing those things around you every day till you decide to buy it, you know. So how, how is our online behavior influencing these things that are being done to us? You know, I feel like, or not even just that I feel like, I kind of knew that a lot of people do not value their data. You know, a lot of people do not understand um, how important or how valuable their data is. And so they are not careful as to who they share it with, where they share it, how they even store it, whether it's safe or not. And this has its own repercussions. I'm not going to go into the issue of cyber threats and all that. But I think from the angle of the user, there needs to first be proper awareness, you know, on what is on the internet, you know? I'm not just using the internet with like-minded, smart, beautiful people. They are cyber criminals, they are kidnappers, they are assassins, all using Twitter and TikTok, you know? And you're telling them you're hanging out at social places at social time, you know? So um, we as users, how are we conscious of these threats that exist? You know, how are we handling our data? Are we even demanding for better handling by the people we give our data to? You know, if you give an organization your data, are you conscious of what they're doing with it? Are you even demanding for them to do the right thing based on your digital rights, you know. So these are the angles I like to look at this issue from, and um, I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Right, so awareness. Now, how is India, Karnika said, uh, handled uh, this, uh, this moving goalpost, shades of gray, the awareness paradigm, 800 million folks on the uh, internet, many of them uh, not particularly literate, uh, and however, uh, great users uh, of uh, the data revolution. Uh, how do you think, what would you like your, your audience to know in terms of India's ability to balance this out? Yes, pertinent question indeed. Uh, I think this is something that uh, we, we are really, um, you know, uh, geared up to uh, when we say current, uh, you know, position of India and the regulatory environment in India. Uh, the huge population that it serves is, is, is something that uh, the law-making process is not something uh, which is very simple because obviously it has to cater to so many people and different demographies and different culture and different uh, way they access internet and the information they circulate, the, the posts that they make, uh, the way they give away data. So it is something which is complex indeed. However, um, we do have a very promising future because, uh, you know, we have Digital India. Today we have huge number of schemes uh, which have also benefited the rural India, apart from urban India. And more incubation centers, more innovation uh, is, is occurring, especially in the software development segment. And with the growth of AI, uh, ML, uh, it, the increased accessibility, there is a lot of e-governance also, a lot of benefits which the government is also giving out to uh, the citizens at large, and uh, the mushrooming of the e-businesses. The consumers are e able to have access to a lot of benefits and facilities and across various sectors. And that is a big boon indeed, including the education sector, particularly during the pandemic, the way it has, uh, the technology has aided in the education and the revolutionizing the entire uh, ecosystem of, uh, you know, across the world, including in India. So that's something that I wanted to highlight. Having said that, I think it's important to also, uh, you know, mention a few things about Indian law because I've been practitioner of law for about two decades or more. And uh, from the privacy segment, sir, uh, the privacy and uh, data protection go hand in hand. And uh, on the other hand is the surveillance sector, you know, surveillance area. So when we say freedom of speech, for instance, or uh, the right to privacy, that's ingrained as a fundamental right in the Constitution of India, particularly Article 19, freedom of speech, and Article 21 of the Constitution of India for right to life and personal liberty. 
And very lately, we had uh, a landmark judgment, uh, Justice K. S. Puttaswamy case, where this has been upheld. And thereafter, we, we, the country uh, witnessed, you know, the growth of um, the debate on data protection, and we had the PDP bill, which was tabled. And after that, uh, it's currently been withdrawn for various reasons, particularly because there were a lot of amendments being suggested. And from, from that uh, perspective, we needed uh, something uh, more robust in terms of framework, and therefore that process is still ongoing. Now, as I said, right to free speech and surveillance needs a fine balance. Uh, we need to protect consumers. So we've had reforms in the country on the consumer protection side. We've had new e-commerce laws also. And what information a consumer is giving away. For example, if you're just using a food app, you want to download a food app, uh, it's obligation on the part of that app to actually let you know, have a privacy policy and a terms of use there. And explain what data they are collecting, what, what what use will they make out of it, and the permissions they are seeking, they often are uh, more than what is necessary to provide the service. And a consumer, you'll agree, I think, uh, Samal, that they give away this data. And that is the problem, uh, you know, that is a problem area. So in the country, we've had some new, uh, you know, or robust laws which have occurred in the consumer protection side. Data protection, we're already in, in the midst of uh, making laws. We are also in the midst of making a Digital India Act to congregate you know, various areas uh, on, on IT law. And due diligence guidelines have been passed for intermediaries, uh, social media as well. Then we've had some quick six hour, within the six hour window, uh, cyber incident response you know, to be given in cases of attacks, especially on critical systems or otherwise protected systems. So those kind of changes have occurred. And uh, so if I may add, uh, the surveillance, because Mr. Um, Obroy mentioned, there are certain parameters. You know, just answering his question, uh, you know, uh, there are what parameters? Under Article 19.2 of the Indian Constitution, we have very clear, uh, you know, parameters, which are, for example, um, if there's a threat to national integrity, sovereignty of India, friendly relations with foreign states, or if there is any, uh, you know, uh, public order, questions of public order, incitement to commission of any offense. Those are the kind of criteria which are mentioned in the Constitution, and that only under those conditions, they, if those are fulfilled, can the uh, law enforcement, you know, act and maybe intercept uh, any communications or ask for any data or any kind of law enforcement action can, can occur, including blocking of a particular shutdown of a website or otherwise. So very clear guidelines, even under the IT Act, when and how this can be done needs secretary, uh, you know, IT permission or home ministry, uh, you know, permission. Those kind of permissions are needed by the, even the current law. So um, now, Supreme Court of India also gave very clear cut guidelines on interception in the PUC and versus Union of India case. So if you were very interested in the area, you can probably read up more on that as well. And we've had many instances of shutdowns. JNK, uh, you know, there were certain shutdowns, internet shutdowns, even cases of, you know, they have been blocking of apps, uh, even TikTok was banned in India, you know, uh, problems like Blue Whale, which have affected children at large. In different sectors, we've had different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, closures. For example, YouTube, uh, Assam Royce case, YouTube shutdowns were there. So there have been many instances, but those are grave instances where there's a threat to public order. There's a threat to national integrity or sovereignty. Those kind of issues, only their surveillance and the other actions follow. And uh, another question which was addressed to Mr. Obroy was evidence. Uh, if the court allows, yes, we can give, give that evidence. Once the seizure is made, the evidence can be collected and uh, the Section 65B certificate is needed you know, as an affidavit under our evidence law in India, uh, which says that, yes, this was collected if you're giving a secondary evidence. If you're giving the original device, well and good. But if not, then you can prove it by your secondary evidence. And we usually have a process of giving an affidavit by the chief technology officer or the concerned person who has mirror imaged that particular device and submitted any data. So those kind of processes are there. I've been very fortunate to be a part of the, uh, you know, uh, teams, uh, rather e-committee working uh, on this in this regard in the Supreme Court. We've had very many uh, reforms in the digitization segment, even in our court system. So that is a promising, uh, you know, move as well. 
And uh, apart from that, I uh, just want to mention one more thing, since we are talking about future technologies today, AI, ML, and you know, metaverse, and uh, we're talking about responsible AI. Niti Aayog has come up with many papers on the same. Uh, VPN, those are key areas, cryptocurrency. What kind of data can be taken by the law enforcement? And how much cooperation is possible? Is encryption breakable? Can the data be given? Those are the kind of issues we are now seized with. And of course, ML80 system needs an overhaul. I completely agree with uh, Mr. Broy on that. And we need a good convention on cybercrime. And I think at the UN level, we're already having talks. Again, I was uh, fortunate to have given some recommendation there. But I'm just thinking that EU versus UN, what will actually happen? You know, we don't know as on date, but on a, uh, from a personal standpoint, I've uh, seen uh, a good uh, number of, I would say, robust points, like quick timelines, because three years is a very long time to get hold of data. It's too much. That's a very long time. So, and the retention period. Thankfully, the retention period of social, for social media intermediaries and other, like, cloud centers and all has now been five years. How much time the data can be retained? TRI says one year. IT Act says 180 days. Yeah, so there has to be, you know, you will all agree with me in the room that convergence is what we are talking about. So if I'm using a handphone with an internet, I will be governed by IT Act if I, you know, I'm on the net and I commit a crime. But if I'm just using a conventional phone, making a, you know, phone call, then try guideline. So the, we really need to have a convergence from that point, I think, in terms of law. And uh, the last point that I'd like to make, sir. The mirror imaging uh, of data from the localization, data localization standpoint. Uh, the data localization was being a big debate in the PDP as well. Now, uh, only critical data like health records or something like payments, how much money transactions have occurred uh, for Indian citizens, uh, financial data is governed by RBI law. So there it is, um, um, uh, you know, certain information like financial data will only stay in India. That's the RBI guideline. There have been some strict guidelines also on use of credit cards and saving them on cloud of late. And uh, last, in fact, uh, health records. Health records is something that uh, is very sensitive, biometrical data. So we will, I think, in the long run, have uh, you know, a tighter law on that. But uh, mirror image data will always be needed in, in those kind of sectors, at least, if not completely banned. Out, you know, to keep them outside Indian servers, uh, out of India servers. If there's no complete ban on that, there would be at least a mirror image of the same uh, being asked to be put up under Indian, you know, segment, Indian, uh, I would say, jurisdic jurisdiction. So uh, just given your broad perspective of what is happening currently in various quarters, try IT Act, surveillance, data protection, privacy, but yes, there are sectoral laws, and they are also very, very important. And we are at a junction of law and technology where all areas of law are actually converging into cyber law. I have seen that happen over the last two, I mean, I'm sure my colleagues here on the panelists here agree with me. that in a number of areas we are synergizing, not only within India, the different sectors, but globally. When we talk about technologies like metaverse and AI, we cannot have uh, laws and silos. I think a lot of best practices will be there curled out across the globe. And those are the ones that we will be developing uh, in terms of our laws, uh, you know, after having some SOPs. We already have a lot of groups talking about them. And uh, there are initiatives in the EU, there are initiatives in Niti Aayog here, here as well, in, uh, AI. So we look forward, we look forward, sir, uh, those uh, kind of best practices will also help shape a harmonious uh, law, which will create more liberalized economies, which will create more business, more investment in India, because India is the place for uh, you know such action today. And uh, being a proud Indian myself, I, I think we, we, we all are gearing up for uh, you know, making this uh, possible through congregated effort. And this conference is, is an apt example of that that we are all here, all thinking heads from various parts of the world, talking about how we can support each other, collaborate with each other to create a harmonized system, you know, across benefiting across various nations. Thank you.
Great. So, uh, I mean, it, it depends on interpretation of 19.2, whether you're reading the wire or the Swaraj, and which state the, the thing has happened, uh, which state's law and order uh, officer is in play. But having said that, and having got a magisterial uh, sort of diversity as well as uh, some certain commonalities, I was wondering in the uh, few minutes that we have before some of us have to be taken away uh, half asleep, uh, is there something that uh, needs to be uh, asked here in terms of uh, whether the state has the right to teach us uh, the, 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 the Eric Byrne thing about parent, parent, child, 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 parent, that sort of thing. So does the, the, the eyes, my eyes are, are on you, does it actually uh, uh, have the scope of an adult-adult relationship or is it more like, uh, the state is my parent and I'm the child and the state can always tell me. So uh, remarks, pushback, questions, the house is yours. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll let the questions come in full blast rather than one person being allowed and the uh, panel spends a lot of its time dodging around it because your questions or your remarks and pushback are also part of this discussion. So you may already know what you're saying, and you, your question is just for politeness, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, the lady here. I, I'll, I'll keep coming to the question still. Yeah. No, maybe because of uh, the, the camera recording, it will be useful. Be the gallant. Yeah, here you go. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just your name and uh, your remark. It's actually a question. Okay. <laughs> Svetlana Zenz. Uh, well, I actually have a question to Kornika Seid because uh, we work kind of in the same area with digital rights. And I'm in Myanmar, you're in India. And I would like uh, to ask a question in terms of uh, what the upcoming data protection law. So, and I know it's a long uh, story about uh, the law itself, but however, would you recommend some uh, the most necessary safeguards for the civil society to put aside the regulator from affecting the civil society being surveilled uh, constantly by the regulator. Thank you. Right, so that's uh, Burma as well as Cambodia, I think. That's where you're working as well. Uh, so your question is uh, basically how user can be safeguarded, is that? Yes, we'll, we'll pull the question. Thank you, uh, Chakunte from Cameroon, Franklin. For me, it's just a remark because I've noticed that uh, surveillance is used by the dominating parties to the dominated parties. In my country, like in many others, uh, surveillance are used to fight opponents to the government, okay, to stop their voices and so on. In this case, it is used by the dominating parties is useful in this you case. You have opponents it's, there, right? Yeah, oh. in right. many countries, you know. In this case, the governors will be using this tool, okay, in positive way, okay. In another way, they will tell that okay, surveillance is not normal and so on. So it depends on the, you know, this is a tool that can be used in one or another. The second remark is about the forensics. Okay, we can use the forensic, the police, the scientific police can use forensic to recover cyber crimes to know what, is, what has happened so far, you know. And they, have, they will use also surveillance during the process to maybe look for evidence and so at the end. You know, so surveillance for me is a tool which uh, the statutes can be uh, fine uh, concerning the objective that you want to reach. So these are the two remarks I wanted to state. Right. right. Now, thank you for bringing this additional shade of gray. Uh, yes, please. And I would like to know if there are any others yeah. before the panel responds. Yes. Yes. Any other? Okay. Yes, please. Okay. So thanks. Uh, my name is Gilbert. I'm CEO of Africa Cyber Defense Forum. My question uh, goes back to what, uh, uh, Madam, uh, is it uh, Oberoi? I hope I pronounce it well. You know, government is the only institution with monopoly of violence, right? It, it's, it's monopoly of violence. Government is the only institu institution that has that monopoly of violence, as you always say. The government can commit crime, but still justify it. 
right? So the question comes in, uh, for example, remember the issue, uh, the case that came in, when you talk about algorithm, right, encryption, uh, the issue of uh, Apple, right, the iPhone issue, where the government was justifying, you know, what the, the tech companies should allow uh, the government to have access to such devices when it is justified in the case of national security. But the question comes in, and I think Apple to this date is still a, a, a back and forth where Apple refused to cooperate to give access to this you know, high level encryption. And the question comes in, at what point uh, you know, do we balance, yes, now these are national security issues, give government access to this high level encryption, right, because these are national security issues, and what guarantee do we have that once the government has that level of backdoor, it doesn't use, I mean, Snowden issue, everybody knows the Snowden story. So a what guarantee the government itself can find is only used uh, for this uh, specific crime. But what if the government, I mean, we know what the government is able to do, it has the monopoly of violence. What if God ends up using the same encryption that it got in Sega case and use it now to now, you know, even commit more crime? Thank you. How do you balance that? Very much. Yes, please. Uh, I think you'll need a mic there, uh, gentleman in the gray suit. And if you can identify another uh, question here, then we'll have the mic sent much faster. So this is probably the, the last question before the panel takes or, uh, makes a remark or two directly. Uh, hi. So hi. I have a I have a comment. Your name? My name is Utsav Mittar. Uh, so the comment is, uh, you know, I feel like, um, you know, I just remembered the Indian God, like if I, if I, you know, take the permission to mention his name, like Lord Chitragupta. So, you know, he is watching everything, whatever you are doing. And I think, uh, uh, you know, from that perspective, uh, all the commerce, government, they have that capability to monitor each and everything of what am I doing day in, day out. Like the commercial organization knows that I am in this place, I travel this place. Like they have, they might say that uh, that the humans are not looking at that data, but the data is still there. So coming to my question, uh, all the data laws, all the regulations, they are silent on the government's role. Like with the the balance that we are talking about, what is the reasonability of collecting data? So, but no, I don't see a definition over there. If we talk about, uh, you know, what is our reasonable, are we crossing a red line? So we have made regulations that this can be collected, this cannot be collected by the commercial organizations. But it's also about walking the talk. They are not mentioning that what data can government can or cannot collect, you know, for a individual's right to privacy. That is not being, you know, talked about. Any last remarks? So it's already past 10.50, so we've done well. We worked hard. And uh, Samir told me that uh, the index of the success is to go on till the midnight hour when there is freedom. So, so clearly, uh, we won't push the uh, hospitality till that level, but a few minutes more with the consent of the ladies out there uh, would be in order. So uh, Madan, would you like to take it, uh, defend the, the good State intent, no defense. <laughs> so I, I couldn't agree more with many of the points which were mentioned with regard to surveillance. And it is not the case which we are putting forward that it should be uh, capturing of uh, doing surveillance for each and everything without any procedure, without any oversight. So if you recall, my comments were that we have to first establish the need and the grounds on which the need can be justified. So there was a question about dominant party and dominated party. But if it is falling, who is judging that what is being uh, put under surveillance is right or wrong? It has to be according to certain predefined rules, pa parameters, and an oversight body. So if they are in place, then I think that some of the questions are being addressed already. What remains to be left uh, remains left is whether those uh, implementation part is happening properly or not. So that is the first part. 
without going into the question of uh, any particular case in terms of Apple or anybody, I will not go into individual case. But the question here is, what is uh, the role, what should be the role of uh, any entity entrusted with the duty of protecting the lives of citizens? If there is uh, information that there is some information which can, uh, which may be available in some device, some uh, encrypted message somewhere, and without understanding that, maybe there may be a bomb blast which may lead to loss of several lives. Now the question here is, what is the proportion proportionality principle here? What will define which uh, the uh, what is more important at that particular stage? Is the individual privacy of uh, one person more important than maybe the lives of 100 people? If that is a question, there will be a different answer. If the question is, is the individual privacy more important than maybe uh, protecting the theft in a house, then it is a different answer. So th those principles of proportionality have to be put in place and how do we fix that? Again, going to predefined criteria, and they have to be defined and they have to be implemented in proper way. And that, that is the only solution because there cannot be whites and blacks. There will be, as uh, Roiji was saying, shades of gray, which have to be. And we have to uh, walk through these uh, situations every day, uh, looking at these shades of gray and trying to identify the best response. In terms of uh, the Chitra Gup and the data law in terms of the role of government, I think uh, Dr. Seth will bear me out even in the act which was withdrawn, there were the, the conditions which were defined under which they can be collected. So they were there. Even in the existing laws, I think that Dr. Seth already enumerated them under what conditions surveillance can be done and those conditions are already in place. I will not comment on the protection of uh, uh, data protection law because it is still not there. But what I saw, I, and I saw some initial versions, there were provisions there. I, maybe uh, Dr. Seth would be a better place to put that perspective. Thank you. I'll just comment, add to what uh, Mr. O'Broy has said, with your permission. Uh, there, whenever there's a reasonable suspicion that there is, a, you know, a criminal activity ongoing and uh, there has to be a, a law enforcement action or uh, investigation to be conducted, in those scenarios, and there is some tangible evidence, some reasonable suspicion coupled with some tangible evidence, can the, you know, the process be started and, you know, the seizure of the particular electronic uh, like you can say gadgets be made or interceptions are done and then for each of those things blocking interception gathering traffic data or any kind of analysis there has been a set protocol you know there is a set procedure as well so if if a particular need or situation has arisen and those uh, you know situation demands that this is uh, you know to be done for example threat to national sovereignty for instance just an example then there is a clear suspicion, there is a reasonable parameter for that, and there is a, some tangible evidence. Then this whole process is initiated, and everything has to be done in accordance with law as per SOPs. It cannot be something in violation of the same. Government is as responsible for uh, you know, adhering to these uh, privacy uh, norms, the country or the rules. Um, one clear example was the PDP, which has now been withdrawn because government was equally responsible for adhering to those rules which a private entity would have to. Now, uh, even in our current IT law, even though the PDP is not there at the moment, our current IT law makes such government agencies who are holding such data uh, you know, in confidence of a user uh, any data which is shared, for example, by a user with a private entity, for example, if you wanted to avail a broadband service, for instance. Similarly, if a government entity has collected a data for a, a particular purpose and with due consent, then that data is also to be kept confidential by the government. And that, there are clear provisions even under the IT Act currently, which make government as responsible and accountable 
to keep that as confidential. And our current consumer laws also, you know, require this privacy policy terms of use. Similarly, for even private companies, that is there. So uh, now that is what I wanted to emphasize on. And our Supreme Court of India has very clearly explained what are those criteria and conditions, what are those laws which have to be, or principles which have to be abided. Uh, in, in the PUCL versus Union of India case, when can interception occur? How much is to be collected? What is necessary? How it has to be, you know, uh, preserved and uh, returned, or uh, you know, something which uh, which even needs a destruction? It may be even done that, you know, accordingly. So there are clear norms in the country. It's not always uh, in the law in every law, but uh, most of the IT law, I would say, in the country will have to have clear provisions, and government will be equally responsible because privacy is something that uh, you know we are very very um, looking at it for the lens that uh, like EU, you know, you have consumer centric laws and human centric laws. And India is equally, uh, you know, uh, vouching for the sentiment. And we, we are actually are expecting the new law, which is coming to have, uh, you know, reflect these principles. Sure, uh, I just hope that um, my initial comments did not make anyone think that, um, for instance, social media is not good, or you shouldn't give any organization your information. Um, I think what is important is for us to know, for instance, how to seek redress when things are not done the right way. For instance, if you ask an organization to respect your right to privacy or your right to be forgotten, and they refuse to delete your data, and it's not on the grounds of um, some law that requires them to retain that data for a, a, a set duration, then you should be able to seek certain redress. You should, there should be clear, clear guidelines on where you need to go to, who you need to talk to, and what can be done. And then there should be some level of trust that justice will prevail. Because it's one thing to seek redress, another thing for justice to actually happen. You know? And so as users, beyond being conscious of um, what we are doing online, we should also be conscious of well, the laws available, um, doctor has given us several examples in India and our different countries as well, we may have laws, some may not have yet, and that may be grounds for you to go and clamor for laws to be established in your countries. I think that's all for me. Thank you. Yeah, let me add uh, as a final comment, maybe uh, one of the thoughts I'm, what bugs me especially uh, regarding the issues of who is watching the watchers. Um, who are the watchers? Uh, who provides the technology of the for, to the governments to facilitate these kind of surveillance systems? Who is providing the servers? Where are those servers? Who is keeping up with the e-waste? Who is engaged with the data processing? Who is providing the softwares? Who is educating the people at the governments to use this kind of data processing? Who is defining the needs and defining, from a normative perspective, which is still needed to assess threat? And you, if you look at the North European post-9-11 context, the, one of the most concerning thing, and that's why you are here on a Thursday evening at 11, is that the situation is that prevention thinking started to overtake the traditional way of engaging with data collection and intelligence. And the more we include into our, and that's again the proportionality you've already mentioned, as the more we start to extend the definition of threat and potential suspicion, and the more actors we engage into processing and assessing and contributing and analyzing data with future perspectives, the broader the angle is of losing the responsibility points, the accountability issues, and therefore, we really need to engage with different angles, from different angles, with different stakeholders, as it has been also mentioned in your panel, um, with the uh, civil society. Please allow civil society into your meetings. Law enforcement is also treating with a high level of distrust all civil society actors in many countries who are engaged with security and surveillance issues. Also, rethink your relationship with state corporate actors. What are, who, I mean, at the end, who is the most, who is benefiting from the data collections the most, in which contexts? And it can shift, and it can be very different 
and it can touch upon very different issues with the very same beta data set. And I think this kind of layered aspect is something we all have to engage with and be very critical on how we would like to develop a new kind of digital society. Thank you. Good night and thank you very much.